so why don't we get started? Uh, first and foremost, thank everyone for joining um, with special thanks to our panelists and we'll be introducing them in a moment. Uh, the topic today is creating great remote onboarding experiences and we'll be going through tips and best practices. Um, so I wanted to welcome Faye Tracy, Megan Wheeler, Heather Doshe, and um, I'm Nick. I'm going to be coordinating this. I'm with Range. We are a team success software company, and we help teams, especially remote teams, stay in sync, focus on what matters, and uh, get more done and help them foster culture. Um, so this is especially kind of an acute need right now, which we'll go through as well. But I'd love to introduce the panelists and have them introduce themselves. So Faye, if we could start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I'm Faye. Um, I lead our people and talent practice at Robert Walters. Um, Robert Walters are a search consultancy. We're a global consultancy, so we've actually got over 30 offices internationally. But here in North America, we work very much with the high growth venture backed companies, generally around series A to D, um, when they're building out those emerging leadership opportunities and covering everything you would need um, in a startup, design, engineering, product, go to market, sales, and of course, people and talent. So um, from my perspective, you know, I'm seeing what all of these companies are doing when onboarding candidates and those who do it well versus could do it better. So hopefully in terms of my value add, it will be around culture and behaviors um, as opposed to say, you know, HR operations, infrastructure, et cetera. But yeah, excited to, to be involved in the discussion. Great, Megan. Thank you, Faye. I'm Megan. I am a leadership trainer and work with our people operations at Life Labs Learning. We're an organization that offers training, workshops, support to teams, executives, and managers um, on life's most useful skills. And so I've been working in the remote space for about four years, conducting uh, the, the research for our teams around how to best lead teams that are remote, uh, as well as onboard and get those teams up efficient, productive, and engaged. So also very excited uh, to be here and speak with all of you. I see some, even in the uh, attendees, some familiar names. Uh, so it's nice to see everybody. Heather. Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Doshe. I am the people leader at Webflow, where we uh, our group is people, talent, IT, and, and all these things come into play during onboarding. So I'm really excited to share the different perspectives from operations to culture and how they all interconnect. Um, prior to Webflow, I was with Rainforest QA and Hired.com. And uh, I also studied organizational leadership back in grad school. I think Megan did as well. So we've got some similar background here and can bring some of the theory to practice as well as we're talking through this. Um, and yeah, I'm based in Portland, Oregon. I've been working remote myself for about a year and a half now, but I've been leading distributed teams for a little over five years. Great, well, thank all three of you again for joining on, on relatively short order. Um, as, as we mentioned, we're all working remote, obviously, but, uh, and, and Faye actually, um, even though the accent may say otherwise, is located in the Bay Area, along with Michael, my colleague, and myself. Uh, and Megan is on the East Coast, and then Heather, as she mentioned, is up in, up in Portland. So we'll get started. Um, there's a lot to cover. We first will just uh, give some background around remote work itself, how it's deceptively different. We'll talk specifically about the challenges that an HR manager will face as they're transferring over to being a remote HR manager. Um, we'll delve in with a lot of tips and best practices around the first week, which is so critical. And then we'll talk about a plan around uh, 30, 60, and 90 days, how to think about that. Then we'll take a moment, hopefully um, at about the 45 minute mark to answer questions uh, and share experiences from folks who have tuned in. Um, and we know it's always challenging often to get questions in uh, at this um, webinar with so many folks who are participating. So we'll actually follow up on this Twitter handle uh, to answer any questions that are after. So RW onboarding is the hashtag. So first, clearly remote matters to businesses. It's been growing uh, consistently, uh, especially in the last 10 years. And 72% of talent professionals agree that work flexibility, including remote work options, is going to be important for the future in HR and recruiting. Now, of course, that's being accelerated by recent um, extremely challenging, unique events. 81% of employees say that the option to work remotely would make them more likely to recommend their company to job candidates and prospects. And companies with strong onboarding processes improve new hire retention by 82%. Um, so that's critical. That said, the onboarding process um, isn't at its kind of high watermark, if you will. 88% um, don't believe their organizations do a great job of onboarding. 
58% of organizations describe their onboarding programs as focus on paperwork and processes. And employees who have a negative onboarding experience are twice as likely to look for other career opportunities in the future. So this can get, you know, this is a situation that's um, less than ideal and can get very much exacerbated, obviously, when we all switch over to remote onboarding. So let's talk a little bit about just the remote experience. And um, I think uh, with all of your experience working with clients, Faye, it would be great just to, to kind of clarify exactly what makes remote different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's certainly from um, our side when we're speaking with clients, a lot of it is around operations. Um, when you're looking to build a remote workforce, there's sometimes flexibility around location, but actually what are some of the legislative things you have to take into consideration with that? Um, culture, and again, that's probably something I'll talk about a lot, and um, Heather, I'm sure you'll have a lot to say on that topic. I think that's probably the number one thing to focus on. Um, companies want all of their employees to feel inclusive. They want a collaborative environment, but actually how do you make people feel like they're a part of something and a part of a journey when you're working remotely? Um, I think despite um, many, many Bay Area companies being very good around flexible working, there's still a slightly old fashioned view that if you're working from home, you're not as productive. Um, so I think there's a lot of, um, you know, conversations around trust and micromanaging, et cetera, but also you know, getting those clear indicators in place of what good looks like and what you would expect from your employees, um, setting out those expectations so they know, um, you know, how they're performing and able to, you know, continually monitor that you don't have that when you're at home on your own versus in the office and, you know, able to turn around to your manager all the time and ask questions and clearly, you know, even get a feel um, from them in terms of, you know, how they're feeling, et cetera. And I think this, this idea that all of a sudden remote is, we're thrown into the deep end, especially um, with recent events. Oftentimes it's, it seems like it's just dialing up, you know, video conferencing and chatting, but actually, it's much more than that. It's a comprehensive set of practices that organizations really need to develop. I know, Megan, you know, your organization has lots of practices built around this and you yourself having worked um, uh, remote for so long. Could you take us through a little bit just around the nomenclature about how to think about remote versus distributed versus work from home? Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot of different ways of looking at this. And so um, just thinking of remote uh, having one or, or, or more, than, more than that individual for any certain period of time, not co-located or in the same, same location as the rest of their team. Distributed is intentionally having distributed offices, distributed individuals. I'm sometimes thinking of it as having satellite offices. And then the, of course, working from home, which is what the majority of the, the globe is really doing right now. And each of these different ways of looking at working can provide some unique um, lenses to how to actually set up onboarding for success. You're going to prepare onboarding differently if somebody's working from home than if they're in a satellite office or in an office that's remote from maybe headquarters. Uh, there's still going to be a little bit more of that contextual feel. Um, and so just having some of those different lenses can be helpful when thinking about onboarding. Great. Well, and one thing we wanted to underscore is, is the, that really that deep end that a lot of people are being thrown into at the moment. And reinforcing that probably something that everyone is feeling is that when you do do that shift, the first thing that starts to break down is communication. And then it's very usually closely followed by a feeling of disconnection and deterioration of culture. You don't feel in contact or in sync with your team. And the reason behind this is because in person, we have a lot of informal opportunities uh, to renew what are called belonging cues. So those are the events when we can you know, run into somebody by the water cooler, or we can have a, a drop by a desk and have a quick chat. And those actually are critical to keeping the fabric of our team together and the fabric of that, um, of that trust. So we really, when we shift over to remote, we need to be very intentional about we, how we craft these interactions to really encourage the vulnerability, um, everything from just how you're feeling to, uh, to if, you know, if your colleague seems like they might not be um, as tuned in and there's probably reasons behind that, but oftentimes when you work remote, you just don't have the time to ask those questions. So really being intentional about that really reinforces and leads to the trust and in turn the belonging that is really critical. So let's delve into actually the experience that managers have as they shift from being an HR manager to a remote HR manager. And, um, you know, I think 
Faye, you already touched on it around how much culture is important because you talk about this idea of, of the HR manager as the cultural ambassador when it comes to remote onboarding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think um, it's something and you know, you hear this a lot and um, culture is set from the top and it's everybody's responsibility to embrace that culture. So I'm sure um, Heather will have had similar conversations that it's not HR's responsibility culture um it's everybody's however it does naturally sit with the the hr function to ensure that um it's articulated very well and everybody is kind of living and breathing those values um so from an onboarding perspective um my view is very much that you need to make it clear before you even go to market and hire somebody what your message is going to be um because when you look at the stats on it a lot of the reason people leave in those 30 60 90 days is because what was promised in interview and in process is not what has been delivered um, so i think that it, you know from an hr perspective um, it's really keeping on top of your distributed workforce and being sure that what you're selling to pros prospective candidates is going to be reflected when they join um, I'm not sure. I'll sort of hand over to Heather on that one. Um, yeah, it, Heather, it'd be great to yeah. get your input. And then also the, how you coach um, kind of new HR managers who are newly remote, how to think about their workflow, how to make, make sure that they're keeping in yeah. both of their teams and, uh, and their colleagues. Great. Yeah, I would add on, uh, would you add know, on, uh, oh, I'm echoing a little bit. Echoing a little bit. Can you all hear me okay? Can you all hear me okay? Oh, great. Okay, well, I will echo in my own. Uh, so we're living in a little bit of unprecedented times right now where not only are you becoming this um, HR manager that's managing a distributed workforce when you might not have before, but you're also doing it during a crisis. So as someone who's been leading distributed workforces for quite a while now, um, the job that I do today is still very different than it was even two months ago, um, even though our team has always been 70% distributed. Um, so the things that we're doing today are partially like crisis manager, policy upkeeper. Um, there's a lot of things that we're trying to really react with what's going on externally with government regulations and changes, but also trying to keep the peace kind of at home, right? And so um, your job looks very different today. I would call it something of like a crisis project manager, but also, um, you know, a counselor and a cheerleader and all of the above. So I think it really, all of these things are so true. Um, and I would even like kind of think about looking at it at every single level and kind of auditing where you're at on all of these levels, uh, maybe even as a distributed team, but also at a team during a time of a global pandemic, which are two different things, but interconnected at the same time. Um, and so to give like maybe an example of one of those things, um, looking at, for example, like workflow, um, I know we're talking about onboarding today, but every single thing that we might currently do from, you know, all team meetings to um, the way that people just interact at the lunch hour look very different. And so you want to audit and assess what does your culture stand for in a normal atmosphere during these times? And how does that shift now and kind of covering every single base to bring about that sense of normalcy um, as much as possible while acknowledging that it's not normal and, you know, we've got to work through these things together. And we found that that's a, there's a lot on the shoulders of HR managers to do that audit and doing it in a collaborative way where you're having a shared doc possibly with colleagues or even teams helping to give feedback because it's hard to solve for everything when you're re-examining re every single practice. So definitely encouraging people to, to do it in a collaborative way. And, and Megan, you know, with um, your organization being so keyed in on training and helping to, to coach people, how, how are you approaching it with both this crisis specifically, but also um, HR managers and and helping them understand how to support their teams through coaching and training. Yeah, I mean, this, the, the conversation of remote work uh, was something that we were having a lot of pre-COVID, um, and it just threw everybody really into the deep end uh, before a lot of us were prepared necessarily. And so the conversation is really shifting very much like what Heather mentioned, is acknowledging that this is where we are right now. This is not necessarily the optimal or the forever place. However, this is an opportunity to really lean into this idea of optimizing for remote work. Uh, the majority of organizations at this point um, have at least started thinking about having a distributed team or having at least a remote or employee. And so it, by, by really catering the training, the understanding um, on how, how individuals learn with the remote lens, it's only going to improve in-person processes. So even when all of this is over and companies go back into being co-located, 
all of these different processes around looking at synchronous versus asynchronous communications, aligning on explicit communication norms, um, thinking about um, fairness when it comes to learning opportunities um, really only impacts the in-person. So we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of organizations right now asking for the, the managing distributed teams workshop, working remotely workshops, really mm -hmm. giving employees and managers the skill sets to not only survive during this time, but to thrive when it comes mm -hmm. to working and leading teams uh, with the nuances that, are, that, are, that come with being remote as well. So let's shift over into the first week because there's, there's a lot to cover. You, everybody's brought up a number of practices and we've um, put together uh, some recommendations. This isn't completely comprehensive, but hopefully this should help to uh, provide a framework and kind of level set for how people should approach optimizing the first week and, and how it's fundamentally different than it would be if it weren't remote. So let's, let's talk first about before the first week. And, and this is really unique because you're also in a situation where you want to provide um, materials and information oftentimes be before somebody's fully part of an organization. Um, so it'd be great. Heather, how do you approach this? Yeah. So I would just note that again, Webflow is partially distributed, right? So we've got about 70% of our team that's always being onboarded remote, another 30% that is in person. And so now everybody has shifted to the remote version of our onboarding process. Um, and so, yeah, I think just to kind of touch on a few of these quickly, um, you know, it's really important to have your paperwork in a row. And right now, if you're trying to do kind of like a quick, quick shift to things, it might be as simple as having like a single Dropbox paper doc or Google doc, whatever your company really uses with a checklist that you can make sure you're kind of going through maybe a front end for your new hires and a back end, maybe spreadsheet for yourselves to make sure that everything's actually happening. Um, and just making sure that you're not kind of not dotting I's and crossing T's. I know like I nines right now have been eased up on and there's a lot of things that people are kind of being kinder about, but it's still good to kind of just make sure that you've got a system in place to just make sure that baseline things are getting done so that when you return to whatever, you know, the new normal will look like in the future, you're able to really adjust into that new normalcy with some documentation of what's happened. I think the one thing I would just say a hundred times over here, if you take one note is remote work requires a lot more documentation. Um, and so just in general, uh, explicit documentation and shared documentation. Um, I don't recommend things like Excel spreadsheets where you download one version and it becomes outdated by the time it gets to the next person. Like you really want to be aligned with folks. And so when you're working distributed, making sure that you've got systems that hold everyone together and all of these tools are great ones, um, but you don't need to buy a whole new tool set just to make things work during a temporary time period. You can also, you know, think about what is going to make sense for us after this and invest in those tools, but not others. Um, and then as far as hardware goes, um, Apple's really great. They'll ship things directly if you have a bigger business. And um, if not, you can always, you know, it's a little more expensive, but ship things directly to people's homes. Um, and like you said, it's a great opportunity for company swag. I 100% agree. Throw in that same box or in a separate shipment, some t-shirt swag, like let that culture still feel great and encourage people to wear those things on Zoom calls. Um, and then just to speak to the last one, because I think that's the most kind of robust area that people are struggling with right now, which is the home office concept. Uh, so I'll let you all know what Webflow sort of does all the time. Um, and then what we're kind of doing to adapt to this current situation for folks who work in office. So for Webflow being a uh, typically distributed team, what we do is set everybody up with a laptop and a monitor at their home office if they work remote. And then uh, they get an ongoing uh, first one time $1,000 budget to cover things like cords and headphones and whatever else you might need for your home office, even a desk or a chair. But then after that, they get $380 a month every month to cover things like upgrades to equipment or fancy coffee or lunch or snacks or whatever that might be for you, a pretty house plant to sit next to your desk just to feel good. Um, and that number sounds really high for a lot of folks, but when you think about what it costs to maintain an office, um, it's actually much lower. And so if you find yourself saving some of those dollars during this time and you're able to donate them to your employees to help them with their office, um, it's a really great way to do it. And we use a product called Compt, C-O-M-P-T. It's a little weird spelling. Um, but that allows us to monitor it all. So we're not just saying, hey, go spend this and expense it and kind of just dealing with a bunch of receipts. We kind of give the allowance. They can spend it up till it's gone, but they self-manage it. So they've got that flexibility to feel really safe that I don't need to ask my boss if it's okay for me to get, you know, um, a nicer set of headphones during this time when my kids are in the background running around and I feel like I can't focus in my new job. They just have free reign to go ahead and buy those items up to the budgeted amount. And that kind of freedom and flexibility is really valued by our employees. 
And those who are in office don't typically get that budget. They instead get like commuter benefits and in office snacks and all of that. So what we're doing is just temporarily putting all of our team on that same remote budget um, to make sure everyone's got what they need. So I hope that's helpful for all of you in thinking about how to justify the cost as well. Um, if you're spending a lot of money in snacks and catering and all of that. Definitely. We, we also at Ranger are adjusting um, how we normally would give budget to folks for just helping them provide a great work environment or helping them create a, work, a great work environment at home. And Faye, what have you seen in working with clients as far as making sure that the work is done up front so that when they walk uh, or they walk into the video chat first thing in the morning on that, that start day that everything goes smoothly? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this speaks both to ordinary times as well as more so the times we're in right now. Um, so from a paperwork perspective, once a candidate has verbally accepted an offer, it's incredibly important to get that out to them as soon as possible and get that contract signed. So absolutely talk about going digital um, in order to create more of a slick process. There's so much going on psychologically for that candidate and making that decision that to have this in front of them, get them excited, it makes it more real um, and it distracts them from any other conversations about you know, the decision that they're making. Um, in terms of from um, you know, hardware perspective, absolutely, and we kind of touched on this yesterday, get that out to them, get it all prepared, shows an element of trust, it shows them that they are an employee and you know treating them as an employee from when they've accepted that offer um, and and clarity around um, who they should be speaking to and for what and you know yes that can be electronic but it can also be a really sort of fun piece of paper that's laminated that you've sent it to them and it's displayed on their desk at all times um, and I love what Heather mentioned about the home office and the budget and I think from a, a retention perspective little things like that go a long way but what I've also seen in terms of ahead of time when it's remote is um, you know they'll put a coffee meeting in with the CEO they'll send a um, Starbucks voucher or um, uh, any other coffee company not um, promoting Starbucks there um, but um, you know in order to say right this is a coffee meeting but this is going to be on us um, depending on the size of the company and who was involved in that early stage we've seen CEOs do handwritten cards to say congratulations or we're really excited to have you um, little you know just a, a check-in email or a check-in call goes a really long way um, if there's a particular article that you read that is relevant to a conversation you had during the interview, sending it to them saying, I read this on Medium. I remember we spoke about that in our interview, so I thought it might be of interest. I think all of those real personal touches give the candidate that, that reassurance and security that they're joining a slick team, the culture's what was promised, and you know they've made the right decision because there's so, yeah, so much Kind of going through your mind when you're starting a new role we've also seen people send hampers you know welcome bottle of wine so yeah there's the branded stuff but actually um more personal um items as well um so all of those small touch points just to get them you know get them on day one and then it's phase two of you know keeping them 30 60 90 and beyond yeah, and I can add on to that, Faye, as well as it might take us into that next section, um, too. And to, to pick on what Marianne McLaughlin's question was, was especially during this time when it's difficult to potentially get back into the office, get the swag, put it into the, the boxes to send. What we're also seeing, so much what Faye mentioned from research, is that individuals who not only feel like they're a part of the team, but who can be themselves, um, tend to be more engaged with the work that they're doing. So... Um, a few companies that we're working with um, are doing a lot of the, the user guides or getting to know me. So in that first week uh, coming in, a part of the agenda, they can just prepare, like here's the first week, here's the first month of what your calendar is going to look like. Um, here's access to your email, here's access to your calendar. Um, in the very beginning, the, having that first morning, a virtual breakfast with a few close teammates, as well as filling in their getting to know you um, sheet. Um, and so if there's one Google Doc with the person's information on who they are as a human, uh, their likes, their dislikes, their, their pets, um, pet peeves, in fact, um, and then that can go back to the team. So then during the first month or so, having the team reach out for scheduling those meet and greets uh, can be really helpful and welcoming for that, that person. 
Um, so having that clear agenda, um, having a bit of, of who they are. One organization I was speaking to this week, um, it was part of a new hire's responsibility to find one object in their home, bring it into that weekly all hands, and they, they got to show what that, that object was, talk a little bit about themselves, um, and they did that for, for all the new hires. Yeah, they do that at Envoy as well, actually. They, but it's it's specifically for your mug, whether it's your coffee or tea mug, um, and again, give you um, budget to go and buy one, and then you talk through why you think that mug represents you very well, um, and it's just a bit of a, a different icebreaker. And yeah, those belonging cues um, are 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 so critical. I think you know, obviously, being able to to buy your own personal coffee and then sharing that out is very critical in Portland, Oregon, where everybody has. <laughs> Um, but we've actually started something where we have a, a cookbook uh, that we just have in a shared doc. So everybody has recipes they like. We probably get into some pretty big debates if everybody added their favorite coffee. But, you know, that's that's also a, probably a Slack channel that we need to establish. Um, but it really helps you feel part of the team because you automatically start to get a sense of, uh, of, of kind of the story behind the pictures. And Range actually has as part of its product a team's directory. So you can put faces to names very quickly. And you can also add things like your hobbies, things that you're interested in. And that's really critical because you might not have the time, you know, even on the first day, obviously, to meet everybody. But even if you could just start to get a, a sense of that, it's, it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it'd be, it'd be great for uh, Heather to talk about how do you coach people around really maintaining and establishing great run one-on-one -on -one approach and, and how they feel connected to, you know, office buddies or the rest of the colleagues in that first week. Definitely. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, I think, you know, whether you're in person or you're remote and whether it's a time of uh, pandemic or not, the most important thing a manager can do early on with their direct report that's a new hire is to set really clear expectations um, in a very supportive way, like having a plan for what's expected and how they're going to be supported and trained to get there. Um, and I would say that's like 300% more important during a time like this. Um, when there's a variety of personal health issues, mental health issues, family changes, all kinds of things happening all around a person who's now taking a new job, which is also a time of a lot of change for a person. So it can be a lot at once on that person. And so really having empathy for the person. A lot of times what managers will do is they just won't say anything um, because they're kind of afraid to like rock the boat and they want to be kind. Um, but then what ends up happening is expectations aren't really set early for what's expected in that job. And in a few months from now, when things start to shift again, and you're saying, well, why isn't this new hire performing, you know, it'll be a question, right? So I think it's especially important to set expectations now. Um, and so again, just going back to the thing that like costs zero dollars, right, is with every new hire, I recommend, and this is something that you can create if you are on the people up side or on the team operations side and you're running onboarding for the company, you can create templates for your managers. Um, and if you're a manager or a department lead or anything like that of a team, I recommend creating a, a simple document um, that you can kind of have a template space ready to go and do it with the new hire one-on-one -on -one to say like, hey, here's what the first 30, 60, 90 look like. Here are the expectations we have. Like, here's what, how we're going to support you. Here are the training programs we're going to offer you as a part of this. Here are some things you can do when I'm busy and I'm not available. Um, here's a whole list of resources that we have. And you sort of prep that document a little bit before going into that meeting with the team member. And then when the team member starts, you can say, okay, like, let's finish this together. Like, does this feel right for you? Um, recognizing the times that we're in, what it's going to take for you to learn on the job right now, all of those things. And so not saying, like, it's important to kind of take the pedal off the gas in times like these and be kind to people, but not setting expectations at all isn't necessarily the kind thing to do. It might come back to bite everybody later. Um, and so really being cautious around how can we set realistic expectations and how do we commit, like what are our agreements? What are our non-negotiables around what happens when this plan isn't working for one of us or it's not going on track or whatever else? How do we have conversations? I love the idea of doing the user guide, like Megan mentioned, we do that at Webflow. And whenever I go in to have a difficult conversation with somebody, I try to read their user guide beforehand to say, okay, how do I want to approach this person? Um, and so building that into those expectation plans so that that member knows kind of what your preferences are and you can understand what theirs are. And it's really a mutual respect relationship helps build a lot of trust and clarity. Um, because yeah, the number one thing I hear is that people just don't know what's expected of them in the first 90 days. And that's at normal times, not during times like these. Um, and so how, how do we kind of double down during times like these? Um, and then I just want to add also on the happy hour, um, one thing that we do at Webflow all the time, um, because again, we're always distributed as every Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific, we have a coffee chat um, where people can come, bring coffee, have social chat time. It's so important. Um, if you think about the amount of hours you probably spend during the week at work, just kind of chatting with people by a water cooler or whatever else. It's five minutes here, five minutes there. You stop by a desk, all those things. 
remote people don't have those opportunities and that's why they can sometimes feel really isolated. Um, and so kind of building that into that first week and giving them a chance to be introduced with their fancy mug or whatever the thing is that you're introducing, giving them that chance to sort of connect with people in a group setting, but also in a one-on-one -on -one setting too, setting up multiple meetings throughout the week and normalizing the social contact. I think um, the, yeah, that, that sense of really being super defined, especially obviously in a, um, in a, in a moment like this, is so crucial. Um, Faye, when you counsel your clients around um, the role of HR, the HR manager relative to the role of the manager, especially mm -hmm. for something like workflow walkthrough, yeah. when should the HR manager step in and help to facilitate that? And should they actually dial that up during in a, in a remote environment, as opposed to saying, here are the you know tools and, and, and practices and hand those over to the manager? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think certainly, um, you know, HR builds out that infrastructure and um, process in order for the managers to then adopt that. But again, you know, you hear all the time that the reason that clients want to bring in a more strategic HR leader is because, um, you know, you've got managers in place who are very good in their IC roles and very good at what they do, but they're not necessarily an excellent manager. Um, so I think it's very dependent on the situation, but you do see a need for a lot of handholding from HR um, in these early days. Um, I think another thing, I guess, to add on some of the things Heather said about, you know, structure, expectations, etc., is also um, making them feel not too much pressure from early on and, and giving to them a bit, you know, structure and reassurance that the, the first 30, 60, 90 days is about you getting them embedded, you giving them all the support they need, um, and that there's not going to suddenly be a difficult meeting within four weeks or whatever because issues have have come up um so so yeah certainly i i see um the hr role um work very closely with the manager as opposed to a hands-off in those early days because of course um it's very costly if you get it wrong um you make a hire and they leave within those 30 60 90 days um it's costly from a time perspective potentially working with consultancies. So I do see um, a lot of hands-on involvement from HR at that point. Um, I do also, and it may well be we go on to this a bit further, in addition to, again, setting out expectations, etc., is also ensuring there's a very good, solid training program in place, an induction program that's not just three days. Um, if you're working on site in the office, that's fine because you're back to your desk in between. But I think from a remote perspective, what we see work very well is pretty high touch for the first couple of weeks at least. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my mouse seems a little aggressive. <laughs> um, Megan, with all of your experience uh, working remote, when you you know, shift over oftentimes that idea that you brought up about asynchronous communications, which is something that Range fundamentally believes in, and that's what our product helps to enable. Can you talk a bit about that and then and helping also to establish that work cadence um, up front? Because oftentimes if people aren't as used to doing that, really switching to asynchronous communications is actually more of a mindset shift than it is necessarily just kind of doing a, a slightly new practice. Yeah, absolutely. I would imagine that um, a lot of the people here today are probably feeling the, the shift uh, that it's not going to take the exact same practices where we would have a lot of meetings um, in person and then just duplicate them to be uh, remote. And that one of the benefits of being remote is that a lot of the way that we can communicate uh, doesn't have to be synchronous in the moment. Uh, so the biggest thing that we've seen effective um, in this area is establishing that co-created, that communication a playbook where those norms are, are set up. So everything from Somebody could be at a, an organization before using Slack and say, hey, I know how to use Slack. Come into the new organization. Those Slack norms can be very, very different. So just having all of that uh, laid out. Um, when do we use the at channel or the at here? Um, which channels are, are, are we supposed to be communicating in, in which areas? Um, and then even between a lot of organizations, I'm, we're seeing the shift for, for groups that are going from being used to being co-located perhaps using the G Suite. So they've got their Gmail. 
now that they're going remote, they've got their Gchat operating at the same time they've got Slack going and they're emailing one another and it's just creating a lot of fatigue and impacting productivity. So getting really super clear on what those norms are is, is, is imperative. Um, and then from an asynchronous perspective of just looking at what are the expectations of turnaround time? Um, what are the expectations of, uh, depending on which medium we're using? Um, and then what happens if asynchronous becomes synchronous? So one of the, the, the rules uh, I've loved that we picked up from a, a fully distributed team was that if they went back and forth on Slack more than three times, it would automatically prompt uh, a video call of just turning it on, quickly talking it through, and then going back to, to the rest of the day. Uh, so really leaning into the systems, the processes, having that all established, really similar to what Faye was mentioning, but having that all documented uh, mm -hmm. so, that, so that individuals really know what to expect, um, mm -hmm. and particularly who to go to for questions. So Heather was talking about all of that information coming in, um, but when there are questions around IT, um, who do I go to? If there are questions around this topic, who do I go to? Um, and if I have questions around this playbook, um, who do I go to? Uh, because all of those questions really tend to come up at the very beginning and in the mm -hmm. first week or two. I think we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about this, but so much of that, the first 30, 60, 90 days um, mm -hmm. is uh, not as much about jumping in and expecting to be 100% productive in the work that's being done, but really um, having that person get acclimated to the culture and the communication style of that organization will only improve. It's kind of like that tech debt. You've got to get out of that before people can truly run at full mm -hmm. speed um, after a few months of, of aligning on what those expectations are. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point and something um, worth mentioning in terms of the different, you have to be far more granular, I think, when it's remote versus on site, because when you're on site, you're looking at everybody else's behaviours and seeing what the right thing to do is. I had a scenario previously um, with a fully remote candidate and um, they were a bit of a night owl, um, came to life um, around midday, um, we're delivering, we're doing incredibly well, but then again, you know, early on had a difficult conversation because people weren't able to reach them at certain times, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, I, I was called upon to um, mediate on the situation. Um, and then it was a case of actually, we, again, being very granular, but also, right, let's set out that everyone does need to be online at, at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m. or whatever it may be. But yes, if you're a night owl and that's when you do your best work, do that. Um, but let's have some sort of structure that is synchronized, um, as you say, Megan, throughout the whole company. We've actually found a range to define, you know, specific collaboration working times. So from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., you know, in, in whatever time zone is expected yeah. that you will be able to be on, on, online to be collaborative. And then that we can make adjustments over time because we're really rethinking actually the whole work week because some people, yeah. you know, with kids and everything, it's a very kind of unique set, um, setting. Exactly. But, you know, being very explicit and intentional is so critical. Mm -hmm. And also recognizing that while leaning in as an HR manager and setting up more meetings in the first two weeks, it could throw off their perception if they haven't worked uh, remotely that there are lots of video co uh, meetings all the time and those are synchronous yes. sessions of engagement. So you also want to clarify, this is ideally not the norm and we have collaborative sessions that are reserved when we'll ha have more of those meetings because all of a sudden they might go, wow, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting my calendar to be full of you know, meetings all the time on video, which is mm -hmm. you know, less than ideal as far as really going to work. Well, I think um, Heather, you started talking about this and, and Faye as well. And let's get into the, um, Okay, actually, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Just to, to your comment, I know there's probably a few other HR geeks in the group like myself, uh, but just keep in mind that some of this is going to have to vary based on the kind of employee that you have. So classification can be a little bit confusing right now, depending on how your company is set up. But if you have, um, you know, exempt employees versus non-exempt employees, contractors versus employees, um, there's only so much that you can legally require or not require someone to do at different times. And so just be really cautious around um, understanding that if you've got a team of people that a one size fits all mentality may not work across the board. And if you're ever, you know, unsure, there's a lot of really great resources out there for how to understand the classifications of folks and what you can and can't do. If you look at like SHRM, SHRM or other organizations out there. Um, but there is definitely some nuance to sort of expectations around working hours and all that sort of thing. So just, just be cautious, but yes, it's a great idea in, in theory. That's a great point. Um, I think that uh, the, the 30, 60, 90 by plan has come, come up a number of times. 
Uh, and I know, Faye, you and I have talked about this. Could you can give an overview of a best case scenario and how people should start to think about developing this plan? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that the responsibility on this is on both sides. In my view, from an employee perspective, you should consider yourself, um, you know, still in interview during that time. Um, and then from the, um, the client side and an HR perspective, um, ensuring that you are still, I say rolling out the red carpet, that should kind of be a consistent thing anyway, um, but not take for granted that you've got to that point, you've got them on board, thank goodness, what's the next search we need to fill, um, but actually let's try and retain um, these, you know, this person that we have. Um, I, I, we spoke yesterday in terms of these questions around have we lived up to our promises? What do you think we do best? I think those are incredibly valuable questions to present. Um, I, I imagine Heather's probably got examples of good platforms in order to do that. And technology obviously plays a big part here around, um, you know, employee surveys and that sort of thing. Um, but I think that, um, again, the training um, and induction should be for the first 90 days and not just for the, the first one week. Um, thinking about all of the, and I guess some of these are somewhat obvious, but assigning them to a buddy. Um, may, most companies will do a weekly all hands remote or not um, and so everybody again at 10 a.m on a Tuesday is coming together and you're seeing the whole company there and kind of what you're a part of because the buddy thing the team thing and team meetings that's all great but if you're part of a global organization of 200 I think it's really important to feel that um, because that's then you know shown in your work and and um, the culture that you bring to the company etc um, so Equally, um, you know, thinking about what did we say in interview, what did we promise, and are we doing that? Transparency, incredibly important. Again, another reason you see people leave is people buy into people, and um, you, they join, and the, the person that interviewed is leaving. Um, that is incredibly impactful. So I think, again, transparency from the beginning. Sometimes that can't be helped. Nobody was to know, but um, they need to have relationships with more than one person and their, you know, their reason for being there, not dependent on just one excellent manager. Um, so that if that excellent manager leaves, they stay. Um, so, yeah, I, I think those are some of the kind of key things. Um, again, yeah building chemistry with the whole company, building um, excitement about the product and what you're building and not tying it just to people, particularly when you are a remote worker. And Heather, about the 30, 60, 90 day plan, how do you like to approach that? Yeah, I wrote it in the, the chat because someone had a question and now uh, I think I described it a little bit there for folks, but basically it's really simple. I can send it out, but it's not, it's not rocket science. It's really just documenting all the things that are in your mind um, in a really clean and thoughtful way for the employee so that when they leave a question. So remember, like, I guess maybe just put yourself in the shoes of being a new hire yourself and you hear all kinds of new information and you're like, I'm hearing this, I'm hearing this. And then like Friday rolls around and you're like, whoa, I don't know what just happened. I don't know what day it is. I don't know where I am. Information retention can be really overloading and flooding to people in a new hire week. So it's really just documenting those expectations and making a space for that person to take notes for themselves too as they're going. So there's a single source of truth for all of those things. Um, so for me, what it is, like the three components of the 30, 60, 90 are, um, what are the learning objectives by this date and writing it as an objective, like by this date, so-and-so should be able to do X, Y, and Z things, right? Um, and then the next column would be, and how are we gonna train or invest this person to get there? What are the trainings? What are the meetings? What are the opportunities to get there? And then column three is, and what are the deliverables? And usually there are no deliverables in the first 30 days. It's really just focused on learning, and objectives of what you're going to learn. But by the end of the 90 days, when you're sort of fully ramped, and I usually do an even 120 and beyond sort of thing, um, you can sort of see that the deliverables become the job description by the very end, right? So it's how do you get them from nothing to that spot over time? Um, and just kind of visualizing it, because I know it's oftentimes in our own heads, um, but that's just kind of the reality. And then I would just point out also that really depends on who you hire. So if you're looking at really junior roles or people are first timers in a role, they're gonna need a lot more support than somebody who's 
doing this job and they've been doing the same job for 10 years and they kind of know all the systems, they're going to ramp a lot more quickly. And so just kind of having some space for flexibility and whatever those plans are to accommodate the specific person that you're onboarding. I think it would be great to share that document on, you know, hashtag RW onboarding afterwards so everybody sure. can take a look at that. That would be great. Um, well, I am conscious of time and I know we, want, we have a lot of questions. So just wanted to cover kind of last check in on, on best practices um, or really the, the top line ones. And, and Megan, what are some here that really jump out to you? I know you reviewed the, the importance of practices. I know that um, Life Lab Learning has a number of them documented, um, but are there any things that you really reinforce to, for people to keep top of mind? Um, the one-on-ones is, is huge. I mean, we see that in person as well, but uh, actually I'll put this in the, the chat as well. We, um, I saw Heather uh, made a note uh, of Donut. Uh, there's tons of really cool ways of, of creating those, those kind of link ups, uh, but we collaborated with Donut um, on this. Uh, we have a methodology around engagement. We call it camps, which is really looking at providing an element of certainty, autonomy, meaning, progress, and social inclusion. Um, I'll put all of this, um, but not to be distracting in, in the session, but I'll put that into chat um, afterwards. One of the things to provide certainty, especially during a time like this, where there is a num there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of when this will end, what the impact will be. Uh, so creating those designated spaces where people know that they can have the time to connect um, in a synchronous fashion. Um, this might seem really, really obvious, but any conversation should be over video. Um, Turning on the camera, there's so much psychology and science that shows by being able to see the other people's faces, we're more likely to connect with them, have more liking for them, have more willingness to collaborate. Um, so while it might seem like a really obvious one in the remote space, having video on it is huge. Um, and then having everything written down. So having a playbook for the organization, playbook for the team. Uh, what are our team norms that we have agreed on uh, so that everyone throughout that process uh, just like Heather mentioned, there's so much information during the first 30 days of someone's job that um, it's really hard to retain that, even from an effective frequency perspective. It tends to take us 60 or 6 to 20 times of hearing a message before it actually sinks in and we can process that. Um, I open this up to either Faye or Heather as well in terms of things that, that you would add from, from a good practices perspective. Okay, so let you go. Do you have anything to add? I, I think that's kind of covered everything. I, I, yeah, I'd re reiterate what, um, what you said there. I absolutely agree on the video side of things. Um, the culture ambassador, absolutely. Again, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for that. Um, so yeah, no, I think kind of covered everything there. <laughs> The only, the only other quick idea I might add, which all of everything that was said was great, um, is one thing that I've started doing with new hires. And again, like a lot of things that we're sharing here are something that a manager would do with their employee, not, a, not you as the person leading onboarding. So our job as the leaders on the people side, assuming that that's who's most of in the room, you don't have to onboard each person, create these docs for each person, do any of these practices with each person. It's you helping managers, giving them that toolkit to do that with their own teams for the most part, right? Like there's company level onboarding and then there's team level. And so then at that team level, one of the things that I, I learned, because I did it with my own boss, um, and then I've now been doing it with my own team members, is a 15-minute daily stand-up at the end of each day for the first 30 days. Um, so just the over-communication bullet point, it's so important. It's so huge. And a lot of times new hires, even experienced hires, are just afraid to bother their boss too much with questions. Um, so they sort of withhold and sometimes they create like a list on their own and they wait till they're one-on-one, -on -one, but maybe a whole week has passed until they have that one-on-one -on -one meeting. And they're sort of got this long list of things that they don't have answers to. And they kind of just never get those answers. And so it can sound micromanagey, but it's really not. And letting that team member say that you can cancel anytime if you don't have anything, this is just a chance for us to get face-to-face -face time, catch up. If there's any little questions you've just been like, I, I'm kind of bugging me, I want to know this, or why is this that way? It's our time to ask. And then if we don't have anything, we can sign off for the day, not a big deal, but it's more of a resource to you. And if you position it that way, it won't come across as micromanagey. And it was incredibly helpful for myself as a new hire, and I'm now finding it helpful for my team members as well. Yeah, the stand-ups are so critical. We do asynchronous check-ins every day, um, which really helps to clarify. And that's super important, obviously, for the new folks to just get see what everybody's working on and also be able to participate. We also find that just having actually a Slack channel just for their onboarding 
is really useful and, and, and plus again, people that are, so they may feel, well, I don't actually want to head up another meeting, but just starting to get into pattern of asking those questions and have everybody jump in feels really collaborative and, and much more fluid. Well, I know we have a lot of questions, so let's shift over to that. And I think everybody here um, uh, should be able to stay a little bit longer, uh, but I know Heather, you might have to jump to it at, uh, on the hour, but let's um, start with questions and my colleague Michael is, uh, is going through them. Yeah, um, so one of the first ones that came through is from Jennifer Louie, and she's, a, she's in a CEO role um, at a small international NGO, um, but is also responsible for CEO and CHR roles, um, rather activities. And she's wondering um, how she can be a culture ambassador um, during this time while also being very re a very realistic COO, um, just kind of being mindful of where they are as an organization. Um, any any suggestions there, maybe from from Heather or uh, Megan? I'm happy to jump in first. I would just say, like, props to you. It's a lot of jobs. It's hard to wear a lot of hats at once. Um, you know, it's never easy to try and be everything to everyone. And I would also say, like, you probably have your own things going on in your personal life. You're also dealing with the same crisis. So just be kind to yourself if you feel like you're maybe underachieving against what you were hoping to do. I feel like that every day. So I, I hope that you know it's normal to feel like you can't be everything to everyone. Um, but I would say that I think the most powerful thing, and I saw an article recently, I think, I'm not sure who posted, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, um, but they're talking about how the new title of a CEO is Chief Empathy Officer. And so it's really not around what your title is as much as the role that you play for the team that you have. And I find that when somebody at the C-level, um, especially a CEO or a COO, is thinking about culture number one in times like these when there's a bottom line that is also probably on their mind, it goes so far with the team. And so I don't know that there's like an actual black and white answer around balance, but I would just say if you can find a way to find some small wins and know that um, it probably means more coming from you than it does coming from the HR person sometimes, uh, that, that, that really means something. Um, and it can be as simple as just acknowledging that it's a tough time for people as you introduce new initiatives. Totally would second that. Additionally, uh, when possible, um, with, it, with the empathy, um, showing up for, if, if there is like a video um, lunch, uh, showing up, modeling, being there, modeling, taking that time, um, modeling, setting boundaries of the workday. Um, being kind to your own mind is, is really helpful because that is sort of the signal setting action that the rest of the, the company is going to be looking at, um, as well as whenever possible, delegate. Um, people um, would love to, to jump in and, and see if they can create something social um, and, and be the more of the driver of some of those activities uh, so that it's not necessarily all on one person's shoulders. Um, but, but echoing what Heather mentioned that this is um, that you are wearing a lot of hats and so also have empathy for yourself. Thank you. Um, there's a question I've seen from now a few people um, around documentation. And so I, I saw maybe first from Robin and just recently from Rebecca um, and just kind of managing um, collecting documentation from for new hires um, when they start. Um, so kind of if someone doesn't have a scanner, doesn't have a printer, but also you need to see some of these documents in person, but obviously they're remote. How are you managing that? What suggestions might you have? I can add a few and then please do correct me, um, Heather and Faye, uh, uh, DocuSign, HelloSign. So there are um, some apps and some programs that don't require printers. And in fact, you can um, just do all of it electronically. I did see similar with that program, there were questions around um, I-9s. So the, the government is, is loosening up on needing those documents in person for the moment. So there can be some, um, I, I can try to find the, um, the link, there's a link from SHRM that even kind of breaks down the different, uh, what's happening currently in the state um, of, of, of not having access to go into an office to show documentation. So it can be shown over video. And then once the person is um, able to come into the office, then they have a certain amount of time that they actually have to be there in person to show things. Um, if the company is already distributed, that there are, um, and we can kind of go back into a notary, there are definitely opportunities of having a notary sign um, saying the documentation was there in person. But Heather Faye, would you add anything else? Spot I'm on. Sure to find that article. If you are able to offer a road office budget setup, letting people know that they can also expense a printer or anything else like that if needed. Um, but all of that is, I think, pretty correct and great. 
Yeah, I think obviously it depends on the size of the company and budgets and things like that. But um, exactly, you mentioned DocuSign and then there's HR. If you've got an HRIS system, that should be able to send out your offer letters electronically as well. So um, it's not often that we really see it um, manual now. And uh, yeah, there's lots of electronic um, opportunities to yeah create more of a, a slick process on, on that front. Oh, and one quick thing, even if you don't use like DocuSign or any of those, if you happen to use like Greenhouse for applicant tracking system or other applicant tracking systems, a lot of times they also have an offer letter feature in those apps too. So check every tool that you have to see if that's a possibility before worrying about, especially in companies where finances are tight buying a new tool. Great. Um, I, it might have been touched on and I might have missed it, but I had a question here from Beatrice who's in Bucharest, Romania, who um, just kind of wondering, like, it's everyone knows it's important for new hires to meet everyone on their team, um, but that's quite easy to do when you're a relatively small team. When, when you're talking about a team of dozens or maybe even a hundred people or so, kind of how do you go about um, introducing a new hire to each of those people? And um, kind of, yeah, what recommendations might any of you have there? Um, I, meant, I mentioned on this one earlier, just quick um, contribution from me, and it's the all hands. So um, again, most companies I work with will do an all hands each week, which is led by the CEO. They'll talk about how the company are doing, but you know, very transparent conversations um, and, and everybody has to be there. There has to be a good reason not to be. Um, and then something similar, again, just from what I've seen to what Heather mentioned earlier, Friday afternoon, you know, whether it's drinks or coffees or whatever it may be. Um, but I think it's very, very important if you're a company of 100, 200, that there are certain touch points that you are all in, um, you know, electronically the same room at the same time. Um, you do also see companies have um, annual um, off sites where everybody from around the world comes to one place. But again, I'm conscious that that certainly couldn't happen right now. And, um, and, and budget comes into that too. Um, but that's obviously incredibly effective and a good um, talent attraction tool when you're demonstrating on your website and your LinkedIn and all those sorts of things that, you know, everybody met in Paris or London or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I mean, I think there's a big difference between 15 people on a team to 150 people on a team to 1500 people and beyond. Um, a lot of it's around signal to noise. That's sort of like the internal marker that I try to use when deciding which programs to do. And so um, the amount of signal to noise, if you're hiring one to two new people every week, sure, yeah, for, have it at your town hall, have it at your all hands, have it at whatever meetings that you're having, because um, you're only probably spending maybe five minutes at most introducing those new folks. And that's a great amount of signal to noise for that size team. But if you're 15,000 people and growing and there's 50 people starting every week, maybe not such a good idea. Um, if you do use Slack or other um, kind of like discussion group based tools, you can also introduce there. Um, and if you find that there's a channel that makes sense to do so, like a welcome channel or something that you can kind of create for and people can opt in to join or opt out. Um, if they find that it's too noisy, they can leave. And the great thing about having, you know, a thousand plus employees is that you don't need every single person to welcome the person. When you're 15, all hands on deck. Everybody's got to welcome that person. But when you're 1,500 people, let's say there's like 50 people who just really love engaging online and they want to get involved, they can welcome those people and they'll feel very welcomed. Um, so I think it's just really understanding the nature of your group and thinking like, what's going to make someone feel welcomed? And it's a great time to just like be empathetic from your own perspective and think what would that person really um, value? What would I really value in this time? Um, and it doesn't need to be every single bell and whistle at once, but picking the things that really match your core behaviors, your company's values, and, and aligning your practices to that. I've been at companies where every new hire got to do a lunch and learn about themselves, and it was an hour per new hire, and it became very painful and unscalable <laughs> at 150 people. Um, and I've been places where it was just a list of all the names of new people on a single slide, and you just clapped. Um, and so it really just depends on really what works for you. I think another opportunity as well, okay, not the whole company, but if you're 800 people or so, like Heather says, you don't really need to meet every single one of those. But again, to feel part of something bigger, you know, diversity is a, is a huge piece. So if you're creating subgroups that are... Um, doing activities around diversity within the company or um, 
you've got a culture committee that are coming up with ideas and again they get together via video around the world sporting activities um we've seen it you know i've seen it with companies that um there's a half marathon or you know whatever it may be and you're running it from all different places and that's a group so there's a lot of extracurricular activity as well that i think you could implement that um makes you feel again a part of a wider global organization and I would add to that, we're seeing a lot of, um, of interesting new groups start up with this unique scenario, right? So all of a sudden, the people who are really um, fans of, say, some type of RPG gaming, you know, back in the day, Dungeons and Dragons are now kind of reawakening and, and, and posting things. So I think a lot of kind of look for opportunities where you could form unique groups that are especially uh, useful in a remote work uh, scenario or a remote environment. Definitely one really easy and free thing that we're doing right now at Webflow, which is not something that we're going to sustain forever, but just during these times when people might be not able to do things after work is anyone can sign up to host like a, a daily connection chat is what we're calling it. And so it's like a one hour slot, different themes. And when you let everybody across the team kind of choose the topic, you get everything from Dungeons and Dragons to tarot card readings, to um, mental health chats, to whatever else I'm even doing. I'm hosting a kids show and tell for all the kids who are at home doing nothing where they all get to bring their favorite activity that they've been doing since home to give more ideas to the other kids. And so you can really get creative and it costs zero dollars. And it's funny, we started them as a people team with the first like 20 of them. But now we're having people say, can I sign up for one? Can I do one? Um, and everybody is kind of bringing their own and people are adding on in the evenings. And it's sort of this beautiful thing where you don't need to be the culture carrier because everybody is. Um, and so setting the tone and then letting people take off from there can be really meaningful as well. Um, and it's not just a new hire activity, but for everybody, but also for new hires. Well, I think we have time for one more question um, and then we'll probably have to unfortunately end. Great. Um, and I, I did want to say thank you to the panelists, but also all of the participants who have been sharing lots of resources um, in the chat. That has been, I think, one of the most consistent questions that I've seen coming through. Just anyone have any helpful guidelines or playbooks or practices that they can share with the group? Um, last question comes from Betsy. Um, and she just, I think all of us have started to notice that Zoom has kind of become the default for all interactions and meetings. And um, it works um, for for certain types of interactions and maybe quick ad hoc conversations that need to just happen in person. But um, it looks like she's trying to figure out if any of you have any guidelines for when, like maybe when video is best, but when instant message or email or Slack or some other solution might be um, a better alternative. So really a question around um, communication and like, probably learning how best to communicate with certain um, colleagues of yours. I love any this question because, yeah, it just gets you to think about, does this need to be a meeting? which is such a helpful question that I think we should all be asking anytime. Um, and so we have a, a methodology um, in our meetings workshop, we talk a lot about it, but it's really, we call it the four P's methodology. So just thinking of what's the purpose of this Zoom chat? Um, what's the personal benefit to those that are inviting in? Uh, what's the product? What are we hoping to achieve by the end of the chat? As well as what's the, the process? So purpose, personal benefit, uh, product and process. And if we can't come up with an answer for each of those, it probably doesn't need to be a meeting. Uh, it could probably be something that's done asynchronously. Uh, and then I would also add that the, the benefit of being virtual, and this probably even goes into the question before, is that there's the recording option. Zoom records, Loom is a great recording um, app, and whoever can't attend that conversation can actually watch that recording at double speed um, and just catch up to what was missed uh, but maybe not be there in the synchronous moment. So just utilizing the tech, utilizing the tool, but really um, asking if it needs to be a meeting in the, in the first place. And again, that goes back into to the, the, the communication guidelines, the norms, what's explicit, um, that can be really helpful. Great, well, thank you again um, so much for all the questions that you've sent in. And just a, you know, a quick reminder, obviously everybody's probably, in, in, um, it has a deluge of information they're trying to process, but uh, recognizing the, the great resources that the CDC and the World Health Organization during this uniquely challenging time provide. Um, an emphasis on really working together. We're all in this together to stay apart and stay safe. There are some resources that we put here. We'll obviously follow up both on the chat, but also on the hashtag RW onboarding. Um, we have a uh, remote resources um, uh, article that Robert Walters has, has put together. Life Lab Learnings has uh, a comprehensive playbook 
and range has uh, put together a primer, uh, which top level, which touches on things like communications. And I think, you know, one of the, the key things that everybody's talked about is, is the net really the net, it's so necessary to think through all the practices and develop them fast and collaboratively um, and being just super intentional and mindful about uh, how we're approaching this because remote onboarding practices are just really good practices overall. Um, so thank you again to Megan, to Faye and Heather for taking part in short order, answering all the questions and we'll hopefully continue the conversation and answer more questions um, at this hashtag. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a great day and have a great weekend. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye.